Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on the secrets of digital government success. I'm Meida Basu, Government Siders Deputy Editor. And over the next hour, we're going to hear from brilliant, world-leading GovTech innovators on how they've pivoted to tackle the pandemic. Thank you to our partners at Adobe for making this possible. We've got Lee Hong Yi, Director of Open Government Products at GovTech Singapore. Hong Yi leads a team that's innovated rapidly to tackle COVID-19. From South Korea, Park Seong Ju, Deputy Director of Digital Government Cooperation at the Ministry of Interior and Safety. South Korea is leading Asia in the latest UN e-government rankings. Joining us from the UK, Dr. Tanya Feiler. She leads the Digital State Program at the Bennett Institute of Public Policy and is founder of State Up, advising civil servants globally on cutting edge GovTech. And please welcome Scott Rigby, Head of Digital Transformation, Asia Pacific at Adobe. The company has helped governments across the world adapt their services to COVID-19. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. We will be putting your questions to the speaker, so write them in the Q&A box for me to see. Please put in your name and organization if you'd like them to be referenced. Hongi, if we could start with you. What has COVID-19 meant for digital services? Thanks, Mina. Hey, everyone. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess it, it's, it's no surprise that like, obviously, given that everyone's working from home nowadays, digital services are changing and are going to be a big part of our lives. Um, so that's the first most obvious thing, which is that like, um, I think previously a lot of agencies and a lot of sort of industries in general were sort of uh, some were very advanced in terms of like moving forward, but some were dragging their feet. And I think now, like because of all this, people who are like the, the, the agencies and departments which were, which were sort of like behind a little bit have had to like just really, really catch up. Right. And so, and so there was sort of no more excuses, no more like, um, like you, you can't afford to sort of be cautious with it. You either digitize or you don't exist. Um, and that's, I think, one of the key points that, that, has, uh, that has gone for digital services, uh, which there was always this, I think people have sort of recognized for a while now that uh, at the individual level, everyone sort of recognizes that digitizing was the way to go. Um, but a lot of cultures, um, sort of like corporate cultures, still have a lot of this sort of, you know, in very like processes or FaceTime cultures and things like that, which were really, really, really hard to break because you know, corporate culture is hard to change. Um, I, COVID has dramatically changed that. So I do expect that um, even after we've gone past COVID, like a lot of these digitization changes are in a new equilibrium where like people have sort of this plausible understanding that everyone can understand that digital, so digital things work. Um, I think a big, I, I think one of the probably biggest sort of things to not take note going forward though, is that like we've realized that a lot of digital services are not just things that you can turn on like that. Uh, people have this idea, for example, that only, you know, if only we used AI or like, you know, automated planning or whatever, all this in government, everything would work great. Uh, and it's true to some degree, but the, the one of the things that we've realized, I guess, when trying to digitize so quickly for everyone is that um, a lot of infrastructure to get this to happen um, hasn't just been, just hasn't been laid yet. I don't mean infrastructure in terms of like internet connectivity, though you know, that's obviously one of it. Um, a big part of things is that like a lot of like just sort of base information is not digitized, right? Or even if it is, so it just lives in like paper forms or notes on people's desktop, uh, desks. Um, and even if it is digitized, it's not actually centrally managed where like, you know, you have people's government laptops and they just have little Excel spreadsheets all over the place and it, no one actually has an overall view. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest thing for the future, which is that like, yes, there's a new equilibrium where everyone sort of understands that digitization is going to be an important thing to do, but um, as opposed to sort of leaping to that uh, end state, a big part of it is going to be uh, working on all these infrastructural problems that we've identified now that uh, now that we've tried to push for it. Yangju, what's the perspective on this from South Korea? I have to agree with everything that Lee said. We are experiencing the same thing here in Korea. Uh, after COVID-19, we were put to a test. So we were, but it was another opportunity to prove the existing services with, that we already had, but not have been used widely. Um, and, but then we also had an opportunity to identify where we need to improve moving forward. And it was certainly the time for us to accelerate the digital government innovation plan that we had here in Korea, and that we have seen in person how fast we can move compared to before. Like before, in order to persist, uh, facilitate partnership between the public and private sector, it would take a longer time. But 
up to COVID-19 in order for us to continue servicing our citizens and then get the help need to our citizens and residents, we had to move faster. Um, but we also noticed that um, this hopefully these changes will stick, but we have to work harder to actually benefit and then grow from this experience. So moving forward in case of Korea, and I think it, um, for other countries as well, technology is important, but in order for us to use technology widely and effectively, we have to change the culture of how government works and then we engineer how government um, process internally so that we can promote um, creating better services with cooperation with our citizens and then get our uh, small medium sized um, companies get involved in the make policy making and then implementing those policies. And that's something we're going to talk a bit more about a little later but Tanya I wanted to ask you um, how have organizations pivoted to continue serving the public? Thanks, Maida, and a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Um, you know, I've been working with and observing organizations in a number of different countries, but maybe I'll just start with some observations on the UK where I'm currently based. Um, and I think the first thing to say is that I, th I think the crisis has brought out some of the very best of both our technology sector and the broader government technology ecosystem at all sorts of different levels. So I think you know, we can look to our government digital service and say that it's really stepped up to the mark in things like um, helping with uh, delivering our furlough scheme, for example. Then we could think about innovative startups and SMEs, which have helped, for example, with telemedicine, which, something, which is something that a few months ago really wasn't very much on the agenda in the UK. So we're seeing quite distinctive shifts and at speed, which is really good and interesting to see. You know, we could also talk about the civic technology community, which I think has played quite a remarkable role in the UK story as well. Um, so that's all great to see. And I think it's absolutely the sign of a maturing ecosystem that's rising to many of the challenges of the current moment. And I'm sure we'll come on later maybe to some of the, some of the weaknesses that have also come to the surface. But I think for me, you know, a particular kind of organization that has had to pivot over the past few weeks and months, and I think in a number of countries has done so remarkably well, are parliaments, which we think of as such traditional organizations and so resistant to change in some ways. But I think, you know, from Brazil to the Maldives to the UK, um, legislatures have really at speed moved key parts of their work online. And I think this virtual push has been particularly interesting because it's absolutely not been this view of technology as wholly disruptive and, and trying to make things happen differently. The narrative around it has very much been about upholding key facets of Westminster style democracy and seeing technology as an enabler of that. So it's a very different narrative to some of the perhaps fears and concerns that we've seen coming from parliamentary settings previously. And I think I just maybe add one more thing, which is also about perhaps an increasing openness, openness towards engagement in those contexts as well. And what I'm seeing is, I would say, increasing interest both from parliamentarians and also parliamentary staff in better connecting with citizens through digital technologies. And I think this is really critical at the moment. So as in many parts of the world, at least, we're remaining physically distant. I think keeping citizens informed and accessing their experiences and ideas on these key national questions that we're facing at the moment is more critical than ever. And I'm quite heartened to see these organizations going to the market, engaging with new, new approaches, with new participatory uh, technologies, and even with the open source community as well, which certainly in the UK is not something we've seen in the parliamentary uh, context previously, um, to facilitate that process. So I'm rather an optimist, as you can see, I think, in some of the changes that we, we have seen. Scott, what have you observed on how organisations have pivoted? Yeah, maybe to reflect um, what a number of the other panelists have said, really, which is 
You know, I think first and foremost, we've seen uh, commercial businesses uh, operate at speed and uh, citizen expectations in respect of, of government is very similar. They expect the same type of uh, you know, consumer-led experiences from government that they get from commercial brands. I think three of the participants have mentioned speed and you know, speed is the most powerful attribute of modern organizations and that expectation translates across to government and government's ability to be able to operate at speed. And certainly, you know, through uh, this crisis, we've had different expectations on governments as, you know, new information comes to light and, you know, citizens expect sort of um, governments to be able to, to operate at speed. And certainly those that have been able to operate at speed have been able to adapt a lot quicker. I think certainly there is a heavy reliance on citizens at government at times like this, and they just want government to work. And, and that really means that, you know, um, typical types of services that might have been through traditional means and mechanisms have had to adapt very quickly. And, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of um, governments have some of that foundation in, in place. There's certainly some low hanging opportunities for government to be able to address some of the service needs that came up, whether that be, you know, applying for, say, um, some sort of um, assistance in respect of job seeker or, or something along those lines, through to various types of support payments and so forth that didn't exist prior to um, pre-COVID, uh, had to be stood up very, very quickly. I think we have to acknowledge that the, the future work is here. And so it's not just the, the demand on, on government from a citizen perspective, but also from an employee perspective as well, that um, government have had to stand up operations to be able to support this remote collaboration and, and service capability to their employees. And we're now operating with a distributed workforce and new workflows that need to be able to be supported by government in order to be able to deliver the services that citizens want. And so I think, you know, overly, I think overall, I think it's a, it's positive. I think it's, it's a lit a fire, you know, under all of this to actually progress us forward. Certainly some of the data that we've seen in respect of the types of experiences that citizens are getting has um, progressed forward three to five years based on the, the previous trajectories that we had in respect of service delivery. So I think it's certainly it's, it's made it much more accessible. It's provided across a number of different channels that didn't exist before that. And hopefully it provides a better service overall. Hongi, how did OGP pivot to deliver new services to tackle the pandemic? So there's a few things, I guess. The I guess like everybody, when this first started in January, we weren't quite sure how big of an issue it would be. Um, so, you know, you have some cases here and there. And so the focus there was mostly around like just helping communications. Um, like, let, like, you know, people knew that there was, there, was a, there, was a, uh, there was a disease going around and like they wanted to, they were like, and the main focus was about uh, managing panic. Um, so if people understand like, just, and so what we did was, uh, we were just coming out of a hackathon and we put together a couple of products uh, to sort of, well, the first one was uh, we built a mass messaging tool for the Ministry of Communications. Uh, basically, it's pretty simple. It's just, a, it's just a big WhatsApp bot that, that sends everyone a WhatsApp message about like what the updates are for that day, like how many cases we have, where they came from, where do we know we're following up, uh, things like that. And I think this is very important. Um, because one of the things that you find is that like, uh, particularly in times of like times like this, there, there ends up being a sort of like a lot of just nonsense like, going around. Um, as we've seen in quite a few countries, like there are unfortunately quite a lot of people who are willing to exploit uh, situations like this in order for whatever reason. Um, and so having that direct channel of communication and making sure people, whatever else is happening, feel like the government is like talking to them clearly and like things and like they know where the source of truth is is supposed to spread by rumor. I think that was the first thing that we focused on. Um, Going from there, I think like coming around March and April when this realized this would be a lot more serious, uh, what we did was that we actually had a big meeting to sort of like discuss um, and we suspended, we basically, once we realized that this was going to be a much heavier operation, so apart from just the communication side of things, like a lot of operational aspects are going to need a lot of tech up as well. Um, we suspended all non-urgent projects and I like, started focusing on this because you sort of have this, you know, again, getting, a, getting ahead of the curve, right? And like, like sort of making sure that you, you, you keep this uh, down. Um, and so we suspended all non-critical projects, um, non-time sensitive projects, and then we started working on things like um, sort of quarantine enforcement systems. So if like, you know, simple things like it's an app, if you're on, if you're on a quarantine order, you stay home, you have an app on your phone, it just checks in with you every few hours, make sure that you're home. Um, things like um, helping like coupon systems so that we can help distribute like uh, food and like masks and things like that to low income households. Um, 
and other like you know other sort of like uh, miscellaneous things like that. So one of the like more more boring things that we did was uh, we 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 put together a website to help recruit volunteers uh, for our healthcare uh, for the Singapore Healthcare Volunteer Corps. Um, and it's like the tech itself is pretty boring, right? It, it's pretty much just a basic website and a form that you fill in to sign a volunteer. But being able to bring it up quickly within a matter of day like a day or two, like really helps the response of the various teams on the ground. Um, and so that's sort of where we are now, which is that when we started out, it was sort of like this thing on the side that we, you know, if something aligned, we went ahead. But now pretty much a lot of it is just like going down and figuring out what the problems are with operations and like working in there. Yeah. What's the most important thing that you've learned while leading innovation through a crisis? Most important thing I've learned. Um, the amount of work that goes into building the software is honestly the most insignificant part of any digital transformation. Um, there are things that you have spent years and years trying to push for before and no, nothing happened. But when everyone just decides that we need it now, then actually you can do these things in days. Um, I think that's the big part, which is that it's sort of this realization because there's this, the, the standard, the, I guess the standard narrative when it comes to self transformation is that it's a lot of building work. You know, we have to, we have to write this code, we have to push this, we have to publish that paper, you know, you do all these little things. Uh, and so you construct like a building. But it's less about a build. But one of the things, I guess the thing I've learned now is that um, a lot of this is less about a building and more about like getting people to just believe in things. It's sort of like Peter Pan. If everyone believes the thing happens very, very, very quickly. Um, and especially when it comes to stuff like COVID, like if people aren't convinced of something very basic, um, no amount of sort of like code written is going to help them. On the other hand, if someone realizes that, oh crap, we need to digitize our sort of like temperature taking records like tomorrow, it can actually happen. Like it, Like we have all the tools to make that happen. And so I think... Uh, a lot more focus if you're talking about digitization and digital transformation a lot a lot uh, it's a lot there is obviously a big part of it about writing code and good software and like good product development and all that but a very very big part of this is like sort of seeding this idea in people's minds like it is part of my job to help people like imagine what the future could look like if they did this and if everyone imagines it then somehow miraculously it happens a lot faster than if no one can um so yeah that's that's probably the biggest thing i've learned Thank you. What has been the most important lesson um, in South Korea, do you think? Oh, well, I have to agree with Lee. For us, um, getting information to people was the, f it, it has been the most important thing that we have done in terms of a COVID-19. We wanted to have our citizens um, right information, right number of um, infected, the situation where we are at and the where we are going. And when we started with that, we we earned the trust from our citizens and then foreign residents who's living in Korea. And from there, whenever the, the government launches a service or an app, it's, like Lisa says, it's not complicated. It's a basic technology, but what we need is a support and an engagement from our citizens. And then when we have the trust of the citizens, we were able to facilitate those government services um, crucial to prevent and respond to COVID-19 here in Korea. Scott, what do you feel has been the biggest lesson for you over the last few months? Look, I think, um, you know, certainly when we think about uh, innovation, I mean, if anything, we've seen uh, a large quantity of innovation happening. And I think if anything, um, the speed at which uh, organizations can actually innovate uh, has probably been brought to the fore. I think, you know, previously, you know, we probably saw innovation as something that was aspirational for a lot of um, departments. But, um, you know, if, if you see the right um, level of pressure happening, then we can actually innovate at speed and we can get you know, a collective will. I think Hongi mentioned this in respect of just uh, organizational culture challenges that typically um, can, um, you know, I guess uh, straddle uh, governments and, and hold them back in respect of innovation. We've certainly seen, you know, that obviously been, the reins been removed and, and we've seen innovation happen at speed. And hopefully I think what we'd like to see into the future is that sort of ability to be able to, you know, uh, innovate, generate new ideas, put them into market, pilot them, test them, um, is, is embraced a lot more than in the past where I think we're hesitant to put anything new into market before it was uh, fully tested and proven. And um, I think certainly this, uh, uh, you know, through the last couple of months, we started to sort of release some of the control on that and see how citizens adapt to it. Things don't have to be perfect before we put it into market. We can see how it's embraced and we can start to measure the metrics in respect of performance and output. And um, hopefully we'll continue that forward.
Tanya, what's been the most important lesson in the UK or in the EU? Yeah, I think a couple of gaps have perhaps been exposed, not, not necessarily new ones, um, but things that have come to the surface. I think one of them is around capacity for rapid technology evaluation, um, particularly when services are being outsourced. And I guess another one, which is very closely related to that, is capacity for oversight of large technology projects and the kind of skills that you might need to, to go about doing that. And I think it's led perhaps to a position where there's been a bit of confusion around outsourcing delivery versus outsourcing overall responsibility uh, for an entire project. And there's a, there's a real distinction there. And I think, you know, it goes back to this point actually that has been made previously around managing uh, panic and clear communications. I think sometimes when, when there's a shift too much in that direction, it does create a sense of panic and a, a sense of uncertainty regarding sort of who's managing uh, the, these large scale projects. So I think, um, you know, for me, thinking about then how we address those gaps going forward and how we bring those particular capabilities needs into the public sector in, in, in a number of different countries is going to be really critical going forward. Andrew, South Korea leads Asia right now in digital government, according to the latest UN rankings. What has the country gotten right? Um, I wouldn't say that we got things right. Um, it just in the past few decades, Korea has constantly improved its digital services and how government services are developed. So, um, we started digitizing key uh, tasks of government administration, which became the basis for online services. And then we tried to integrate all the services so that citizens doesn't have to work hard to get their benefits or services they're entitled to. So we provide all um, the government services through gov.kr, which is an integrated government portal. And then we disclosed uh, government data at open.go.kr, uh, where citizens and non-citizens can access the open data provided by the Korean government. And they can also uh, request certain information to be disclosed if needed. And I think those were um, key things that um, the UN look at it, the provision of information, and then how we are engaging our citizens from the policy development to policy implementation. Um, so for the, pub, um, the public engagement, we have government first street uh, website where people can go online and then make suggestions to the government um, on any policy ideas or we host certain challenges to get ideas from our citizens and everything is very user-friendly integrated um, so that the citizen they don't have to search hard to make their voice heard by the government. And Hangi, I just want to come back to you to ask a little bit about how do you prioritize OGP's work in the middle of a crisis? So let's see, in the middle of a crisis, a lot of this is, well, you basically need to be clear less on how to describe this, like pre-planned what plans for the year and very much on like what your end goals are. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of operating in a normal passive government, uh, passive government environment, then, you know, you have planning sessions and you go and you set big priorities for the year and so on and so forth. But like with COVID, as you know, like, like week on week, everything changes. Um, and so the, the underlying goal has always been sort of like, how can we deliver the most public good um, given the limited resources we have? And so I think that's the biggest thing, which is that you have this sort of, you need to be very, very clear on a few things. One is what, uh, like what, get, what actually is your source of value? Um, and I think that's something that's not very clear in a lot of government projects. So like, for example, you start off something like, let's say you want to have a system for, I guess, the different hospitals to collaborate online, right? And like in a normal, in a normal environment, this would be a very fairly large project. You know, you get requirements from all the different hospitals and all the different uh, stakeholders, and then you put up a public spec requirement, and then you iterate over this for like at least a year, if not more. Um, but now you realize you need something like next week, right? You need something where people, and so you get like really, really laser focused and you do something really simple. Like, I mean, like maybe like a Google Docs file or something like that, or, um, or just setting up like a chat group or something like something that's really, really quick, but gets you the value really quickly. And then 
you figure out what the problems are and you fig and then you build out the rest of stuff later. I think that's sort of been the, the prioritization process, which is you're really, really focused on sort of bang for buck um, and like very aggressively trimming out any fat in terms of like stuff that you don't need to spend time building. Um, so for example, um, one of the things with, uh, one of the systems we're building is the, is the stuff, the quarantine, uh, the, the, the app for quarantines, uh, people who are quarantined. Is that the um, but basically, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can imagine doing. There's a whole bunch of like quality of life improvements in terms of like, you know, messaging, in terms of the UI, in terms of the buttons, and, and it's also on the enforcement side, visualizations, analytics, AI, all that sort of stuff. Um, but at the base, base, base level, first thing you need to get run, running is you need to make sure that the app works on all kinds of different devices. Like you just do, you know, if you're, if you're building an app normally, you can have it work on iPhones first and go later. But like, you know, in, in, in this time, nothing else matters except like just having it work reliably first. And then once that works reliably, then you can go on the other side. And so that's an example of like cutting a whole bunch of features that are good to have, but like not urgent to focus on the, yes, let's get the base level of reporting in and steady. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about how Adobe has helped speed up the delivery of services uh, during this time? Yeah, so look, I think probably one of the, the earliest areas that we started to see demand coming through from governments as you'd expect is the ability to be able to, uh, you know, digitize forms. So this is sort of low hanging fruit for a lot of um, governments where they still have a, a large number of paper based forms and they're looking to digitize that as quickly as possible and um, be able to provide digital signatures versus um, wet signatures to obviously prevent queuing or crowding into offices that might have been sort of the traditional mechanism in which citizens might engage for that particular type of service. We're also seeing, you know, a significant increase in respect of government, um, you know, uh, visits to actual government sites. So 60% increase in the last 30 days is how do you actually provide that kind of service through uh, mobile and certainly we're helping enable that to happen. We have microsites through cloud services. We're helping, you know, governments sort of scale up in respect of um, delivering those those consumer type experiences and enabling teleworkers to be able to work from home and be able to you know um, utilize some of those um, services that they might have had um, through when they're working in an office but don't actually have at home all the way through to you know sort of you know multi millions of of communications that might go out every day to constituents around COVID nineteen updates and you know things like um, you know we had French hospitals being able to order PPE gear um, through our commerce technology. And so we've been providing a multitude of services and support to governments as well as you know, access to our technology, um, being able to provide it either at a, a discounted or free in some cases to, um, to ensure that you know, there's continuity of service for organizations, both for their employees, but also citizens. Jiu, you talked about inclusivity being an important principle um, in South Korea. Um, and I know that you're currently piloting some very interesting work to ensure that everyone has equal access to public services. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what uh, South Korea is doing there? So I think in order for government, um, it is important to government to ensure that all citizens have access to government services, either digital or analog. Um, first, we what we are doing is Korea is a fortunate compared to many other countries that we are small in size, so we can actually cover large areas with high speed internet. However, there are still um, rural areas where they don't have high speed internet or Wi Fi, so we are trying to uh, expand infrastructure to those areas. And also, we are um, trying to build digital skills of both citizens and then government officers, so they're more familiar with the digital government services. However, uh, we cannot overwhelm our citizens with digital services. We cannot push them to, you know, become digitized and get used to using digital services provided by the government. So for them, we are, um, also expanding the government services to better assist them in the era of digital. Um, for, for example, for the Bonoro group, we, one of the pilot projects that we are doing is an AI smart mirror. 
So in Korea, we have a community centers where you can go and then ask for um, your benefits or get government services. And when, for instance, um, if you only speak sign language, it might be difficult for you to um, have someone assist you or use existing digital um, services at the center. So by providing AI smart mirror, they can communicate um, with the machine using sign language and then receive government services. Uh, we are having the pilot projects uh, in November in one of the major cities here in Korea, and then we plan to expand the service to the rest of the country um, next year. And also what we are doing is that we are uh, creating an integrated government call center so that if you make a phone call regarding uh, government affairs, um, even though if the conversation cut short and then someone has to reach back to you, they will have your record so you don't have to repeat what you need from the government. And what we are trying to do is that we are, um, we are implementing the document delivery service. So obviously in Korea, many citizens are quite used to online services and then they frequently use gov.kr to get documents from government. However, for the vulnerable groups who are not able to do so, the government will deliver documents to the citizens. Um, those are some of the projects that we are implementing now and then we plan to implement um, later in the year. And we've talked a little bit about the value of public-private partnerships. Tanya, can I come to you to talk about um, how can governments create good partnerships? Sure. Um, I think it's a, you know, a question that is not new, but is definitely being brought to the forefront in the current crisis. Um, I think, look, I think there are a few things. Some of what I was saying before in the parliamentary context about um, more openness to kind of creative forms of uh, part participatory technologies, for example, I think is also about new forms of market engagement, going to the market much earlier, trying to understand what's out there from a diverse range of uh, suppliers, being more open and upfront about potential needs um, and articulating that more broadly. Those kinds of things I think are important. I would also say, you know, there are a set of technologies that we know lots of innovative younger companies are working on developing for the public sector market. They're not surprising technologies. It's artificial intelligence, um, robotic process automation, this kind of thing. But I still think there's often rather basic digital literacy among some groups of policymakers concerning those kinds of technologies. And I think that if we can just up, um, increase that level of basic technical understanding a little bit, it will be hugely helpful uh, going forward in order to have uh, better conversations, let's say, between those two sectors. Um, so I think that's really key, that kind of both the engagement I mentioned and understanding. I think the other thing is probably around procurement. And again, this goes back to something I mentioned earlier. I think uh, something that we've seen in the UK and the rest of Europe as well is um, a strange combination of the award of very, very large contracts and then actually instances of volunteerism. Um, so technologies being provided for free to public sector organizations. And I think that combination is a difficult one um, and, you know, it creates all sorts of potential problems around lock-in, around data, um, things like this. So I think also being really clear about how procurement happens is increasingly important within the crisis context. As I say, you know, the, the, those examples are from Europe and the UK are not alone. Um, I know, for example, in Latin America, this is something that's really rising to prominence. So that a lot of progress had been made in potentially thinking about the accountability dimensions of procurement. And some of that seems to have been um, reeled back a little bit. Um, but what I would also say is that thinking about this procurement dimension as central to good public private partnerships. When we look at how organizations often try to kind of tackle, tackle it and improve it, often it's around 
transparency and using technologies uh, to improve transparency in the process. Things like blockchain, for example. I'm much more keen to see an emphasis on upskilling, upskilling procurement officers and providing um, better forms of technology understanding if we're asking them to, to procure new and emerging technologies. The reason being that if the solution is purely technological, if you take away the technology, nothing has changed. I think it's much more important also to emphasize that human capacity dimension and to think of those two things going hand in hand. So it's not just about transparency. And by the way, I think it's worth saying, you know, in lots of countries, it's not always clear what the incentive is um, for procurement officers to move towards greater transparency. So I think also that shift in narrative to emphasize that it is also about upskilling um, is really, really important. And I think I would just say one more thing, which is for public-private partnerships to work successfully, I think there's also something around language and a need for what I would call digital translators. That's to say people who are able to navigate the interface of policy and technology and to have conversations at the borderline. Now this makes it sound like they're two completely separate worlds. The reality is in, in lots of countries and lots of governments it can still feel that way and so I think the more people we can have, the more kind of cohorts of people who are able to navigate those two worlds and it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be kind of double doctors in engineering and government but to have sufficient understanding of how both processes uh, work and, and different kinds of organizational cultures. I think that's absolutely critical as well to improving um, what public-private partnerships look like. Tanya talked about upskilling. Hongi, I want to ask you about how do you upskill everyone uh, when they're working remotely? How do you recruit people and assess performance um, during this very unique and difficult time? Uh, there's a few things in there, right? So the first one is uh, just in terms of recruitment. Um, it turns out recruitment actually still is fairly straightforward. Um, being a, I guess, tech team, we've always had a fair amount of recruitment sort of remotely. Like people apply online. Um, we do we do sort of a voice um, sort of like uh, phone screens for before I have any applicants. And like previously, we would just sit next to you and watch you code to see whether you're any good. And now we just watch you do that on a Zoom call. And it's not too different. Like you lose a little bit, but not too much. Um, and I would say that like, actually, yeah, that, that, that's, that's actually been fairly straightforward. I think the big part of your, the, um, the thing that actually has helped is that now that I think this is sort of drawn, uh, drawn focus to the need for, for public, for good people in the public sector, basically. Um, I think when things are working well or, you know, working well enough, um, people don't really think about the government or the public sector. In fact, people want to think about that as little as possible, which is generally speaking a good thing. You know, they, they go. Uh, seek their fortunes, they, you know, have fun and build their businesses and do all this. And that's fine because that means things are working well. Um, as I think something that has shown uh, in this crisis is that like, there is a lot of stuff um, that we take for granted. And there's a lot of stuff that like, if you don't have the government figure out and do, it just doesn't happen. Like, it doesn't matter how rich your country is. It doesn't matter how rich your companies are, how much innovation you have in that space. If the government doesn't do its job, everything falls apart. Um, and that, I think, has been a big part of why people, we've had a lot, a lot of people applying because they've sort of recognized that, yeah, they want to do good um, and they want to do something meaningful. Um, the second part of that is recruitment, uh, sorry, sorry, it's, it's upskilling. Um, I think it's sort of a, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these tensions that you have to manage. Um, precisely because over the last six months we so we normally have like quite a bit of time set aside for learning and training and fridays are normally for people to like you know we have internal courses and stuff like that um but given the last few months have been like basically a sprint um we've put that aside initially um i think training in this case has to take place sort of on the job to a very 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 large degree um you really much just need to know all right like what are the three things you need to know to do your job i can't i don't have time to give you a whole foundational course in terms of like modern web technologies and all that but like click this button and do that thing and it'll more or less do what you need um and really being laser focused on that um but what well, what tanya was saying i think is absolutely right um there is a big gap i think we've realized where we talk about sort of digitizing government and we talk about moving forward but um there is this you, there, you have to bring the people along with you, right? And both, both the public and the government officers. Um, on, on, the, on the government officer side, like you, need to, like you need to teach people to use new systems. A lot of people who have sort of like gotten a handle of the old thing, like, and these are complicated systems. 
um, you can't just like slap in a new uh, a new cloud service and say here go go use that right um, it, it there is a real adjustment period and like there is a real and, and even after all that you it might take like you know years before you come up with uh, you come up net positive if everything's sort of built very tightly around it um, so I think you you're not going to expect everyone to be an expert in this stuff but you do need to take the effort to train people even on a basic level um, my my philosophy around this is basically that like if you think computers are important today um, computers are going to be more important 10 years from now and more important 20 years from now, even more important 20 years from now. There is no future where computers are not a big part of our lives. Um, and so as much as it sucks, you do need to know at least a little bit of how it works. Um, uh, for the public as well, I think one of the things that has sort of shown out at least fairly commonly is that um, you, you don't have the luxury of forcing people to use your, 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 confusing, uh, your confusing system. Um, at least for our products, what we found is that, you know, when you're doing some of these like mass communications and apps and services are in a way mass communication, right? They are an interaction that you have, digitized interaction, but an interaction that you have with the public. And if they don't understand how to use your app or your website within like 10 seconds of looking at it, like it's gone. Your, your, your months and months of work, like spent trying to get it all and working exactly right. If they don't look at it in 10 seconds and, get, and, and they can't figure it out, they just, they just leave and they never come back because you just scared them off. Um, and so that's a very, very big part of it. It's, it's about making sure that you really boil it down to really the basics and really the essentials. And like this, we, like you need to tell, like you need to, if you need a job, just say what and where, and we will figure the other stuff out. We don't have like, you know, it's not, it's not two hours worth of form filling. Uh, and if you, and if you need to report where you've been, like in terms of for, for contact tracing purposes, like just give us your locations. I don't need you to sign in and fill in like um, 20 different, uh, 20 different reports um, because that will be confusing. Uh, and, and that, it sounds easy, right? You know, when people talk about Apple and all this sort of intuitive design and stuff, but like for anyone who's done tech, like that's, that's honestly the hardest part, like getting it brought down to something where people understand. Um, so yeah, that, hopefully that answers it. And how, how do you evaluate success um, in a crisis? Um, a few ways. Um, base level is number of people dying. And so obviously that's the bottom line. Um, and it's a weird thing to think about, but like really everything we do now, it's not for some abstract goal. The reason why everything, everyone does their job right now is because if you reduce, like, because this, this thing is exponential, right? If you reduce the sort of growth rate or attrition or, or, or spread or virality rate by like a little bit, that's, that's real life saved. And like, there are so many people in government doing all kinds of different jobs. So it's really, really, really hard to say, um, whether or not think like your particular contribution is the thing that makes the difference, but like you can see that overall um, in areas where, you know, across both operations and tech and policy all works well, it does, it does dramatically save lives. Um, and places where it doesn't, well, people die. And that's, and that's the first most important thing. Um, I think from there, um, once you have that, you can work backwards and identify sort of like the other proximate indicators of whether or not things are going well. Um, basic things are like, is like, uh, uh, is the system reporting the information that needs to report, right? Like, so for example, uh, if you're doing a contact tracing system, like how, like, are you getting good contacts and are you identifying new cases properly? Uh, if you're doing a sort of quarantine enforcement system, it's like, uh, I, like, you know, if you spot check, do, are you actually keeping people at home or are people just sort of like faking the system and then going out? Um, if you're doing a system for mass communications, how many people get, like, there are base numbers that you can look at. Um, and I think sort of data-driven policy, like one of the things you realize is that, yeah, you know, because you're dealing in the public policy sphere, you can't run these like nice tight A-B experiments, but what you do have to look for are sort of these like canaries of seeing whether you're doing something particularly bad or particularly poor. Um, you, for us, what we do is we, we, we try to do, we try to go sort of like a T-shaped approach where like you do, you have your sort of broad-based indicators in terms of like number of users, like people signing on, like are your servers running, things like that. And then like you do user interviews for like maybe 10 to 20 people. Um, like you really just like go down and you just like talk to users, you know, social distance and mask on, of course, but like um, really just see, okay, how, how are you using it? What does it make sense? Anything, any problems? And if, and if you talk to 10, 20 people, like, uh, and you will get the most obvious problems. You won't get like the, you know, the one to 2% problems, but you will get like the 20 to 30% uh, occurrence problems. And like, as long as you, you, you fix those first and, and that's sort of how you get at least the, the breadth of things without having to interview every last person in, in, in the country. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. What are your thoughts on evaluating success? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting because often in, particularly in innovation programs in government, like there's sometimes a tendency away from evaluation, kind of non-evaluation for various different reasons. Maybe budget depends on, 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 on having certain numbers and actually it's easier just not, 
not to measure. Um, so I think what we're seeing now is, is kind of interesting. First of all, I, I think there's, a, there's potentially a risk in the current crisis, crisis of evaluating specifically or solely for efficiency gains. And I think there's more interesting evaluative work to be done. Um, so the first thing is, you know, embed it from the get-go, collect baseline data from the get-go, and be prepared for it to be wide-ranging types of data. Um, I, think, I think this is the other thing. Often we focus on quantitative data collection when we think about measurement and evaluation. But how interesting, you know, sp specifically if organizations start to work, let's say, more with uh, SMEs and startups, which is something we've been talking about, it would be incredibly interesting to be able to go and say, okay, well, what difference has this made to the end user? Actually, has their experience um, been improved by working with these uh, different providers? Because we know, for example, we know that um, if governments start to procure from SMEs, there can be an economic benefit. That's fine, we accept that. But we don't actually know that much about how it impacts the end user, how it impacts the citizen. And so I think the kinds of evaluation that also tell us something about that side of the story will be incredibly helpful and also will help to uh, potentially bolster or tweak if, it, if, if the numbers don't tell us what we want them to, um, how, for example, GovTech innovation programs are run uh, within government and enable, as I say, tweaks to take place if that's necessary too. I think just the other thing I would add is that I think it's really important to think of evaluation as long-term and as a collective asset, particularly around innovative projects. Um, I think it's really important to think about how evaluations can be used more productively to build institutional memory and know-how on successes and failures. Uh, particularly in environments where there's rapid turnover in terms of management and teams. And I think that's something going forward to think about a lot, how you, how you manage uh, knowledge in these potentially quite complex environments, particularly when new products are tried and rolled out. How, how do you ensure that that knowledge doesn't just stay within the team, but is dispersed more broadly across organisations? Jiangju and South Korea, what have been the most important measures of success? That's quite a hard question. We are still trying to figure out how to, um, well, precisely measure the performance of um, digital services. Um, in terms of uh, COVID-19, um, in we were able to hear what end users would thinking about um, government services or the apps that we launched. Um, some of them are quite blunt. And um, during the rollout of the app, our government officials were able to be in communication with our citizens in person. So we were able to hear what they think about the government service, not all of them, but um, some of the major things that would, we would have put it back to work and then make services better, uh, improved an app. Um, other sort of normally we would have an internal uh, performance check within our ministry. So we would uh, make sure that the government, the different agencies, different local governments are not uh, launching a duplicate services and then making sure that they're up to the standard of the government. Honey, I just want to go back to something you mentioned earlier on about the rise of open source um, in the UK and how that's sort of been uh, surprising. Um, Hongi, how important has uh, open source been to the work that you've been doing? Um, it's been pretty, I mean, it's hard to do any work nowadays if you don't use any open source tools. Like, it's pretty much impossible. Um, this, is, this is something that I think people outside of tech may not quite grasp or like don't quite understand the impact of, but like pretty much any developer nowadays worth his salt building any app from anywhere will use some open source system. Um, now, he may use it wholesale. That might be just a wholesale like framework that you just import and like, follow instructions set up from scratch. Or it, could, or it could just be like, for example, your database, right? If you use something like any of the you know, uh, standard uh, SQL databases, they're all open source to some degree. Um, so that has been a really big part of this. Um, the, the thing that I think we've realized is that like, if you're trying to do modern tech fast, um, and especially if you need something like good enough, 
it's very rarely correct to build something yourself, even if you have very specific needs. Because more often than not, someone who, like a, a good open source tool, which has a lot of people have like testing it for years and years in all kinds of different scenarios, will have be, will be better than anything you can build yourself, especially in a short amount of time. Now, if you have a team of like 20 people and you want to dedicate like several years to beating out all the bugs and everything that you put up, like then go ahead. But you don't have that time, so you just need to use what other people have done. Uh, share, share. Um, as well as, and so I think to that extent, uh, we also try to contribute back to it as much as possible. Like we know that the tools we build are not perfect and we have a lot of stuff to do. And so we try to open source as many of the tools that we build um, in case other people might want them. And it's, you know, you, you don't presume that they do. And the vast majority of open source projects never get used. But you know, once in a while, someone happens upon it, like you save someone a few months worth of work and that's great. Um, at least you have a place to start out. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's basically, it's, it is so essential to the point at which you can say that like, there is no such thing as like a digital anything if you don't use open source software. At least that's my opinion. Just a reminder to our audience that if you have any questions at all, just type them into the Q&A box. Um, Scott, I just want to come to you. We've been hearing from countries that are fairly mature in the way that they use technology and the infrastructure that they have. Um, where should countries with less mature infrastructure start? Yeah, look, I mean, I, th I think it really depends. I mean, there's, there's really two two ways to, to go about it, right? You can either look at, you know, mature governments and, and see where they're um, uh, investing their, their time, money and effort and, and look at the uh, the types of innovation that they're creating and look at the application of that to, to your own country. Or alternatively, you know, you go through... Um, identifying what are the friction points from a citizen perspective, where the the biggest challenges for them, and start addressing those problems first. I think maybe to 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 go back though and, and talk about you know quite often there is this this discussion around you know this shiny ball over here being you know some exciting new technology, whether it be sort of artificial intelligence or collaborative robotics or predictive analytics, et cetera, et cetera, and and people get sort of focused on that. I think. Personally, I'd be more impressed if, if people had resolved, you know, some of the more low hanging fruit areas like, you know, forms and signatures, as I alluded to before. I mean, if you had digitized every form that your citizens interacted with your government, that would impress me. And, and even my, a lot of mature governments, I'd argue they haven't gone through that process of digitizing some of the most basic elements of, of citizen um, interactions. And typically sort of forms and signatures are those sort of first interactions that citizens have with governments and and you know if you can provide that sort of frictionless experience that would be the the starting point i'd argue that you could you know get up and running reasonably quickly to start with and and you know low low effort versus reward um before sort of moving to some of the more you know challenging projects some of the more advanced technology some of the the deeper skills and requirements that you need to be able to execute on that I think, you know, certainly that's kind of the starting point. If, if you're immature, you should be looking at and, um, and then start to work from there and build up some of the intellectual capability and, and um, uh, resources to support, you know, further investment as you mature and crawl, walk, run with technology. We've gotten a few questions from our audience. Um, I'm just going to take uh, them one by one. Um, how have governments uh, embraced em emerging technologies like blockchain and the initiatives um, it doesn't say who it's addressed to. Um, Seongju, can I ask you to give uh, talk about perhaps a South Korean perspective on this? So we, what we are using and we are trying to use the emerging technologies um, such as AI, IoT, blockchain in improving our government services. And then in process, um, we have learned that we have to be careful where we use those technologies and how we can maximize the effect of using emerging technologies. It's not just about um, having a fancy technology um, that would help our citizens automatically. Some services does not require any emerging technologies. Um, what, as a government, what we have to focus is that we use right technology for the right service at the right time so that our citizens can benefit uh, from the government service without going through this difficult process of the government trying to um, verify the vendors for AI or any other emerging technologies or for our citizens to be understand what technology or 
even the government officials to understand what technology is going into um, the service they're launching. Tanya, uh, I'm going to direct this question to you. What is your view of governments outsourcing the short projects to consulting IT services providers um, and companies? Yeah, I, I have absolutely no problem. In fact, I'm very in favor of um, good public private partnerships. Um, and those can take variety, you know, different forms. It can be with consultancies, as you say, it can be uh, the broader technology community, whether that's uh, GovTech companies or open source, as we've been discussing. Um, I think it's absolutely essential. Ultimately, I can think of very few governments where you're going to have all of that capability in-house. Um, and I, I, I'm not necessarily clear why that would be the aspiration either. So I think it's very much about then thinking about, okay, these relationships are absolutely going to happen and that's a positive thing and we want to get the most out of them. What frameworks and structures um, and conversations do we need in, to have in place to ensure that those are the best possible uh, relationships available? And I think it goes back to you know, some of the topics we've been discussing already around what capability then do you need in government uh, to ensure that those relationships are strong and positive ones? Um, what, what technological understanding do you need? And how does that need to be distributed across public sector organizations? Because I don't think it's necessarily um, a kind of cookie cutter approach where absolutely every department needs the same uh, technical understanding in-house. I think there's some work to be done around mapping the kinds of technological understanding that there needs to be within different departments and within different teams, um, which I, I think is absolutely you know, territory that probably hasn't been covered yet uh, to do some of that mapping work. But as I say, I think those uh, relationships are incredibly important. And you know, a, a piece of work that we are doing at State Up is actually looking at the specific technologies that new uh, companies are creating for the government market. Um, and trying to map them in order then to help governments as well be able to understand the kinds of technologies that they need to be thinking about and developing some understanding of in order uh, for those relationships to be productive and best serve citizens. So I'm all for a, a diverse um, and vibrant ecosystem. But what technologies uh, do you think have been um, overhyped or let us down? Oh. Um, there's, there's no doubt in a number of um, failed technology projects behind us. Um, look, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, none that necessarily come to mind right now. I think, you know, certainly some of the emerging technologies probably or um, possibly an incubation period have been brought forward and, and, you know, tested probably sooner than they should have been. Uh, but at the same point in time, I, I'll go back to the point I was making before, which is that, you know, it, it's, it, you know, and I, I think um, Hoeing T made this um, point, which is that it's the right technology at the right time. So, you know, while there is emerging technology and Adobe's, you know, the one of the biggest uh, software companies in the world, we have significant investments in artificial intelligence and collaborative robotics and so forth. But there, there's still a lot of technology there that is low hanging fruit, particularly for governments, which in some cases have been laggards to technology adoption that you could be adopting today that's been widely proven. There's a lot of case studies, a lot of support materials material to um, help you get up and running with it that you could start with today and then start to stretch further for some of those more emerging technologies that might be you know ev evolutionary in nature um, but but start with the start with the basics first before before you start the run. Hongi there's a question for you um, how do you build internal buy-in among bureaucrats to take a punt on smaller companies that have promising tech but not a long track record and are there any examples of governments working with uh, startups or SMEs on projects? So there are a few things uh, to this question. Um, so the first one is to, the, the first part is to understand sort of like how internal buying works, sort of in general, regardless of uh, within governments, regardless of like whether it's SMEs or not. Um, and the general sense is that for most of public service, um, the the policy officers who are in charge of that particular decision usually have a lot less expertise in that particular area than you would think. Um, so for example, if you're work, uh, so for example, the policy officer in charge of AI probably has done some reading on it, done some, uh, um, you know, read a few articles here and there and like tries to be informed, but they probably don't have a doctorate in artificial intelligence, just to sort of set that context. Um, 
what this means is that a lot of this, uh, a lot of internal buy-in um, comes not so much from your, I guess, uh, the focus is a lot less on, I guess, the, the, the particular expertise of it uh, and more on the, the sort of consumer level nature of the product that you are selling. Um, so if you went to Google, if you, if you did an AI startup, for example, and you came up with, for example, a, a better way of training like adversarial neural, uh, neural networks or something like that, um, and you had like a 0.3% zero, like gain over a certain data set or something, that would be really interesting. And that might be interesting to a whole bunch of people. Uh, and to a company like Google, which has a lot of experts in this area, they're like, oh crap, we need this guy on my team. Uh, and that could make a big difference. For government, that, that they're not even going to understand what you're talking about. Because where, as Scott said, a lot of this is just getting really basics in place. And so for a new technology, it's less about like whether this is the most cutting edge thing and a lot more about like, can I take this and just put it and have someone use it straight away? I think that's a really, really big part of it. Um, if you're talking about, um, and so, so that's just sort of like the general approach to like helping, like, like getting, getting products in, into the public sector and getting buy-in within the public sector. Um, now specifically with SMEs, a promising tech, but long track record, but not long track record. Um, this is a question of de-risking um, and governments traditionally are very risk averse. Um, and that is the sort of typical approach that, you, that they take, right? So, you know, no one got fired for hiring IBM, for example, that, that's a common saying. Um, unfortunately, that like, you know, that is true to some degree. And so they have a sort of, they're, they're, there's a very strong sort of like a status quo um, bias. The question is how you get around that. Um, so it depends on the motivations of the team involved. Uh, first one is on your, uh, like on the side of, if you are a startup or SME trying to do this, um, go small rather than big. Like, like really just find some concrete way to demonstrate that your product works. Um, if you have an idea and want to do something, that's probably not going to sail. If you, that's probably not going to sail. If you have, can find like uh, some implementation, some company using it, something which is like somebody's already happy doing this and this is not going to blow up in your face, that's probably one, that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, the second big part of it is, um, yeah, like, like, how would you describe this? You are, you are trying to minimize um, the amount of commitment necessary for them to sort of see value in their context. Um, so if you go for a really, really big project, um, if you go for a really big project and, and like, you know, try to bid and say, we're going to take over uh, all of our bus management systems, eh, it's probably going to, like, that's probably not going to, you might have really good tech, but they're just not going to believe you because they, like, if something goes wrong, they'll be like, this guy is no track record, what we're going to do there. Um, but what you can do is you can say you, 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 you actually want to target like demos and experiments and small areas where like apart from having your prior experience, the project that you're doing with the government should be well bounded as well. Uh, meaning that like I want to show this to you here and this will be cool and this will be interesting. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, that's that's a second. Bit. So one, having prior demonstrated success and two, having a small, uh, a, a small target use case so that people can build trust on you uh, from there. Um, the last one I think you're going to have to do is, uh, is you're going to have to come up with a narrative for them. Uh, and this is something that I found quite a lot, especially if you are more tech savvy than your, than your audience. Um, it would be nice if you showed off your technology to them and then the user looked at your technology, understood everything about what it did, and then came up with their own idea of where they could use it and like imagine that future for themselves. Uh, unfortunately, in reality, that never happens. Um, you're just one of a like dozen, if not hundreds of people who are pitching different ideas and projects and you're going to have to do the work of like how this makes a difference. So that's, I mean, for example, right? Something as simple as like digital forms. It's one of the products that we build and what uh, Scott has mentioned before, like it's a really basic thing, like just building digital forms, saves people a lot of paper, makes things a lot smoother, it lays the groundwork for a lot of future things. You can't go to them and be like, we have a digital form product. Do you like it? And they'll be like, well, I guess that's interesting. You need to say, all right, it seems like you have all these, th these are all the forms we found from your department, right? And this is what they look like on our, on our system. Um, you can try them now, you can click on them, you can see what they interact with. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, you can see that if you have all these digital forms and you can hook it up to our like sort of, you know, uh, visual, data visualization engine or our analytics platform, all this, like you need to tell that narrative very, very, very strongly. And if you give them that narrative, they can then echo that narrative a lot more easily internally. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to sort of build that buy-in um, because there is a sort of concrete vision around what, get, what, what you're getting when you're doing this. Um, and if you don't, even if your technology is super, super promising, unfortunately, like as a civil servant, you, you don't have time to go look at every technology and imagine a future for that one technology and every single time you just don't. 
Um, so yeah, hopefully, so those are three things. Uh, one, uh, have examples and work live examples is very good for de-risking. Two, target small projects and so, and like don't say you want to do everything all at once, but like target small projects and then scale up from there. Um, Precedent in government is a really big deal. If one agency has used it, another agency is a lot more willing to go on from there. So even if it's a small project, that is a stepping stone to sort of go to building that credibility. And three is that you've got, you're going to need to build that narrative for them about how, not just what your technology is, but how their lives or their system or their whatever will be better with, with, uh, with you as part of the picture. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. Just as a final note to wrap up, uh, reasons to be cheerful. What excites you most at the moment? Young Jiu, if we could just start with you. Um, I know we are in the very devastating state right now. The entire world is suffering from COVID-19. But just in terms of a digital government, um, I think there's a lot that we can be cheerful about. Um, I have noticed that there has been conversation on digital transformation of the public sector for, I don't know how many years that I can remember, uh, but then it was um, really, it wasn't easy to find that the best practice where citizens actually um, identify and then experience the result of those digital transformation. But in the past few months, I had, I've seen a lot of my partnering countries are moving forward with their digital transformation strategy at the at an unexpected speed. And in Korea as well, in Korea, some of the things would take a month. But um, because of the situation, we have to move forward with partnershiping with um, companies and then working with our citizens to develop government services everything is accelerated. Um, hopefully this trend would continue on um, for the near future. Um, and this is a hard time for all the governments, but I think this is a great opportunity for um, the governments, especially for the government with less mature digital government as this might put them on the map as a digitally advanced countries uh, in the international community. And even Korea as well. Um, this has brought some positive changes. Um, I mentioned this earlier that we have to work on the cultural change and then re-engineering of uh, government administration. And then those were, we knew that we needed to work on them, but not many people have believed in it. So we talked about it, but nothing was really happening. But now because of the COVID-19, we are actually believing in um, those qualities are required for us to move forward and then start working on them. And I think that can be the case to other countries as well. I know that we're just a little bit uh, uh, past our time. So Scott, maybe just in 60 seconds, give us a summary of what you're excited about. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Paul Romo, the Stanford economist, said that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Um, I think this is the opportunity for us to, to um, uh, you know, use the innovation and the speed and the agility and the attention that's been looked at in respect of how we can improve both the, the citizen experience as well as the employee experience and be able to move at speed and, and hopefully when uh, we eventually get to turning the corner. Um, this will become sort of ingrained in respect of our culture and our practices, and we'll start to be able to innovate um, much quicker and deliver better services um, in a shorter amount of time. Tanya? I think that a lot has been made of the paucity of international coordination at the multilateral level, so not specifically around digitalization. And I think what is really good to see is that actually within the space of digital government, I think the story is pretty different. I'm seeing a lot of um, informal, agile conversations between teams in different countries. Um, it's kind of what I would call more a mini lateral arrangement. So smaller groupings of countries working more closely together, sharing ideas, sharing experiences in real time. I think that's incredibly, uh, positive to see and I think that as digital rises to prominence on domestic 
uh, government agendas in light of the current crisis. It would be fantastic to see that um, becoming a model for other forms of policy cooperation internationally as well. So definitely that digital mini-lateralism is very, very good to see. Hangi, your thoughts on that? I think the most thing, to, the thing to be most be cheerful about is that we now have an opportunity to sort of like really move societies forward. Um, because I believe that if you look at the only way you can have dramatic improvement in the quality of human life is by having dramatic improvements in technology. Like that, that's pretty much it. it you, you, you can shuffle taxes and laws and subsidies and schemes and all this stuff around a little bit. But like if you don't have technology moving forward, people's lives don't get better. Uh, and for the longest time, uh, for people who worked in government and technology, you sort of like felt tough because like you had all this stuff that you thought we, you saw we could do, but we were blocked. And I think that's a big uh, but that's not true anymore. Like people do not, I think there is a current zeitgeist where everyone does talk about what the future of government looks like. And it's not like what we were doing before, that we have this potential to basically build whatever, like what we think a better country is. And not, not, not just by sort of these like minor tweaks to like, you know, uh, subsidy rates or tax rates or, or programs here and there, but like really, really like a fully digital, efficient, like driven, like really awesome government. And not just that, but the thing that I found that is most, uh, that is sort of, I guess, most heartening is that like there are other people, like when you work in government, it's sometimes very, uh, government in tech, um, it sometimes feels very isolating because, you know, you talk to a lot of civil servants and you're probably like the only person who's really like, really, really, who's really into computers. Um, but like now because of this crisis, you sort of recognize that like, yeah, like Singapore, Singapore the GovTech, government technology team in Singapore is not the only government technology team in Singapore. In fact, if almost every government all across the world, there are groups of people, some formally associated with the government, some not, some non-profits, who have this same dream, right? Who, realize, who, who see this and be like, actually, we can do better. Um, actually, we can do a lot better. Actually, there's so many things to do. And, um, and I think that's probably the, the, the thing that uh, is I'm most cheerful about, that like, there is a chance now to really do something a lot better and a lot of people believe in it and hopefully we'll get there. Thank you, Hongi, Seongju, Tanya and Scott for a hugely insightful conversation and thank you to everyone in our audience for joining in.